Alien technology. In the mid-20th century, U.S. Army research and development at the Pentagon brought the world into a new age. Incredible advances were made, which helped to bring Americans to the highest standard of living ever achieved by a nation. Were outside sources and government influences involved in the origins of high technology? Does the new quantum leap in technological sophistication suggest the role of some outside influence? Could technology like the microchip, which is ubiquitous in our lives, have come from an extraterrestrial source? Is it alien technology? If the acquisition of alien technology is a fact, that certainly could have happened. Uh, my guess is, uh, that if we did pick up any technology at all, it would have then landed in a very sensitive, compartmentalized uh, intelligence area in which only a very limited number of people would have access to that information. In the late 40s, the US military recovered a spacecraft of unknown origin that utilized extraordinarily advanced technology for propulsion, communication, surveillance, and scientific inquiry. This technology was previously only theorized by scientists. This shocking discovery prompted President Harry S. Truman to organize the Majestic 12, an elite group of high-level government officials, military officers, scientists, and academicians. They devised a plan to dissect and assess the potential application of these technologies for military and commercial use. This process came to be known as reverse engineering. With the advent of the Cold War, the Majestic 12 and its program was conducted under the highest level of secrecy since the Manhattan Project. Their goal was to disseminate these technologies to the private sector at firms which were already developing technologies garnered from the war effort. In August of 1947, an alien-created microcircuitry artifact was delivered to Bell Labs. Bell Labs was ready for the challenge of reverse engineering. Within five months, by December of that same year, Bell Labs would introduce to the public the first electronic transistor. Bell Labs physicists Walter Bertain, John Bardeen, and William Shockley were the first to successfully reverse engineer microcircuitry. This first example of reverse engineered technology showed crudeness in the area of micromanipulation of particles. The revolutionary ability to control electrons would permanently replace the crude vacuum tube bulb. First of all, Shockley and his team had been working on transistor technology. Of course, nobody called it a transistor back then, but they were working on this technology, basically an electronic gate to send electrons through that was more efficient than the vacuum tube. Now, the workbench notes that they had back then, the notes themselves were reverse engineered. They didn't publish those workbench notes until after 1949. Soon, all life on Earth would be affected by this application of outside information. On the day that was declared, the day of discovery, life on this planet changed. Later, General Arthur Trudeau took over the responsibility of distributing technological artifacts from U.S. Army R&D offices at the Pentagon. Colonel Philip J. Corso, intelligence officer for Army Research and Development at the Pentagon, was the first to step forward with information about alien technology. In 1997, when Lieutenant Colonel Corso published his national best-selling book, 
Neither the federal government nor any corporation or individual sought to discredit or refute his revelations about the Pentagon distributing alien technology to the private sector. All this was known, only it wasn't known in the form where we gave from our practice. We gave them research and development projects. One of the things that strikes you most about Philip Corso is not just the fact that he sounds credible, but when you go into his background and you look at the places he's been and where he served and what assignments he's had through the different wars from World War II through Korea then back to the Pentagon, when you look at that, what you see is that the guy just rings credible. He is like rivet plate metal. Trudeau brought him in. He sat at the foreign technology desk as the deputy at that desk for 90 days, and then he went black. He went secret and became Trudeau's deputy and carry out Trudeau's own assignment, which was get this material from the spacecraft into American industry, the only place it could be safe. Are these alien technologies? What kinds of applications did we reverse engineer from outside technologies? Here, Corso said in 1961, he was looking at what turned out to be a fully functional electronic microcircuit. And they brought those, he said, to Bell Labs. Because they knew that back in 1947, Trudeau had told him that the Truman administration, that the Army had brought wiring panels from that, they called it a lander. They called it an alien lander. They brought that to New Jersey, where Bell Labs was. And what Truman said to them back in 1947 was, he didn't know what this was. But he said, what is the lowest common denominator? What is the least complicated device you can create, you can reverse engineer from this? How did we show seeming mastery of the atom without a complete understanding of it? For thousands of years, our concept of the atom was very simple. Only now do we know otherwise. Albert Einstein was the first known theorist on stimulated emission and general and special relativity. These provided a simple conception of the atom for people of the 20th century. One of these atoms probably would appear as a tiny elastic sphere, a sphere formed by negatively charged electrons swarming around a massive nucleus of positive electricity. Public opinion holds Albert Einstein as the foremost authority of the atom. Yet, he did all of his work without ever actually seeing one. Today's scientific activity is being done on the quantum level, Theoretical universal string theories contradict some of Einstein's presumptions on the nature of universal law. Regardless of how scientific theory has developed, recent trends in reverse engineering of alien technology couldn't have begun without these scientific foundations. What does the atom mean to us today? No one had ever seen the atom until the present, but the concept has already helped shape society. Is the microchip an intrusion from an outside source? There should have been a parallel in our understanding of what was being created. Without a parallel comprehension of this technological quantum leap, the result has been social disintegration, alienation, and dysfunction. Our scientific understanding has reached downward to the submolecular world and upward to a new global awareness. Yet these advances contradict a diminishing sense of both community and of our responsibility to Earth and to its future generations. The reverse engineering theory holds that the most advanced technology is the result of an outside influence. Looking at technological advances today and trying to explain how those breakthroughs came about in our society. Either way, uh, reverse engineering fits right along with the natural progression of, of things when new technologies emerge. Critics of this viewpoint put reverse engineering into a category that includes paranormal mythology. 
Well, this is merely an excuse to discount evidence that would lead to a new perspective. Nevertheless, the microchip has become an integral part of many of the electrical machines and appliances that we use today. Its fundamental purpose is to manipulate electrons at the molecular level to perform as electronic switches. In 1958, it was Jack Kilby who was credited with inventing the microchip. In 1965, Semiconductor pioneer Gordon Moore predicted that the number of transistors contained on a computer chip would double every year. This is now known as Moore's Law. Deciphering the microprocessor took 23 years. The microprocessor brought us to increased speed of control of information. In 1970, when Ted Hoff revealed the microprocessor, how much was known about electron behavior? For decades, electrons worked in microprocessors while scientists tried to figure out exactly how they worked. At that time, research was still all in theory. We had no understanding of micro-manipulating mechanisms, ion beam implantation, and electron beam lithography, all used now in manufacturing of electronics. Picosecond imaging circuit analysis is currently used at IBM to study the behavior of electrons in microprocessors. Circuit analysis has produced this high-powered camera to study microcircuitry. A picture of the speeding electron is taken within a trillionth of a second. It has been 40 years since the microchip was invented. Why only now are researchers seeing the submolecular level? Since we can only now recognize electrons at the atomic level, does this support the notion that reverse engineering produced this technology? Is our modern use of microchips and other advanced technologies actually a result of alien technology? Why was the development of alien technology so clandestine? And why would it be so harmful for the public to have this knowledge? What would happen if we learned about the true origin of the laser. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. In 1958, surrounded by much controversy, the laser was introduced. The controversy was a result of the dispute over the question of the inventor of the laser. The litigation that ensued only confuses the fact that no one can claim to be the sole inventor of these technologies. Well, the basic idea really isn't so very complicated. Uh, this is a system for amplifying light waves, and it does it something like this. That inside of this tube, we give atoms excess energy by passing an electric current through them. The light wave travels through these atoms then, takes away some of their energy, and thereby amplifies the light wave. It becomes more and more energetic. It's reflected here, passes through again, is amplified more, reflected again, and passes back and forth many times until it becomes very intense. And one can see here the beam coming out. It travels along a very long distance without spreading very much. Credited as the inventors of the laser, did Arthur Scallo, Charles Towns, or Gordon Gould know where the outside information came from? The laser comes from the application of stimulated emission to a crystal. A photon is introduced through optical pumping. Mirrors are used for multiplying the emission of active photons. How was the idea of the use of mirrors introduced into laser development? This burst in radiation, as all the atoms discharge photons, results in a cascade of light. The beam generated by most lasers is pencil thin and maintains its size and direction over great distances. Army Laboratory at Columbia University which staged its first test on a laser right around 1960. That's where they took the laser cutting tool. Not to say this is what a laser is. They already knew what a laser was. They, what they needed was a working benchmark model of what they could reverse engineer to get a quantum leap on the very technology they were trying to develop. Technology has now harnessed light. The molecular arrangement of crystal gives direction to light. It is the same molecular arrangement that contains light. We now control information in this light. 
Some of the companies that were involved in reverse engineering of fiber optics are Bell Labs, Hughes Aircraft, General Electric, IBM, and Corning Glass. Research was done by thousands of people before the mystery of light unraveled. Unlike Thomas Edison and the light bulb, people are not aware that Charles Keogh contributed to one of the greatest achievements in technology, the harnessing of light. Why isn't K.O. a household name? Has he been lost in the process of reverse engineering? Fiber optics have been manufactured and sold to the public with no question as to its origins. A million years of evolution overnight. How did this happen? Smaller than a human hair, the fiber is two layers, a crystal core with a glass layer. Two strands of fiber optic cables can carry over a thousand conversations. Light is reflected inward from the interface of the two layers. Even though alien crystal fiber applications may surpass our current scientific understanding, fiber optics is so far our greatest reverse engineering achievement. Evidence of high technology continues to surface from locations all around the world dating back thousands of years. The precision attained by these artifacts is a paradox. Present-day scholars remain mystified by the high technology of the ancients. No accurate record has ever been found which has information about the origins of these technologies. Frank Drake, Harvard astronomer, formulated an equation to speculate at the number of intelligent, communicating civilizations there are in our galaxy. N represents the number of stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Current estimates of this number are 100 billion. P is the fraction of stars that have planets around them. Current estimates range from 20% to 50%. E is the number of planets per star that are capable of sustaining life. Estimates range from 1 to 5. L is the fraction of planets in E where life evolves. I is the fraction of L, where intelligent life evolves. C is the fraction of I that communicate. L is the fraction of the planet's life during which the communicating civilizations live. The answer, N, is the number of communicating civilizations in the galaxy. According to Drake, even the most pessimistic estimates yield hundreds to thousands of communicating civilizations. Through the media, we are already sensitized to the possibility of alien life forms. To maintain a logical perspective is a challenge considering our point of reference is only the popular media. The dominant worldview that we've all been raised in for several hundred years now is that, there, uh, that we are alone in a lifeless universe. I think even if a better worldview or a more truthful one or a, one that uh, opens up consciousness to a much more interesting universe, even if, even when that would be the result, change is still resisted because the, the, whatever your existing worldview is, it gives us a kind of complacent sense that we, we understand our world. And when something comes along that completely shatters that, then we don't understand. We, we don't have control. Any, anything else can follow, you know. We're not human! A half a century ago, alien technology made an immediate impact. On Halloween night of 1938, Orson Welles' radio program, War of the Worlds, showed just how Americans would react to news of alien contact. The program caused pandemonium. Some people even committed suicide. It's on you to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, here I am. Wait a minute, something's happening. There's a jet of flames springing from the mirror that leaps right at the advancing men. The logs are turning into flames. I've been surprised to learn that a story which has become familiar to children through the medium of comic strips should have had such an immediate and profound effect upon radio listeners. Flying saucers have invaded our planet. The whole world is under attack. Can it survive? The 
US government took note of the public's reaction to the show. Since then, the government's position has been very cautious on this topic. I don't know what the government knows about this. The, there isn't the government anyway. There are different pockets within the government that, that guard certain knowledge they have very closely. So I, I really don't know. But I am struck uh, by the fact that government agencies, when they do have to speak about this, will send out the most naked disinformation. There's this level of sort of committed ignorance that around this, which is, I think, extraordinary. It's as if uh, any kind of ignorance, any kind of distortion is OK if it's in the service of not letting in certain un in unacceptable information. James Forrestal was a member of the Majestic 12 group and it was suspected that information that he had from his tenure with Majestic 12 contributed to his tragic death. He was an admiral in the Pacific Fleet during World War II, and his military accomplishments were honored by the aircraft carrier bearing his name. In March of 1949, James Forrestal jumped out of his window at the Bethesda Naval Hospital just months after resigning his position as first Secretary of Defense. Shocked nation mourns the tragic death of James Forrestal, America's first Secretary of Defense. Why would a celebrated hero of World War II then commit suicide during peacetime? Was his reaction no different than those who heard War of the Worlds? What information did he have about this conspiracy that he brought to his grave? The government continues to be silent. It's interesting when something is uh, attacking or, or challenging the ideology of a culture, uh, then anything goes. The media can do anything. They can present distortions, lies, bring in people who don't know anything in a way that you can't do in other fields, which is really kind of interesting, which again reflects the fact that you know, anything but that this should be true. A any weapon can be used to fight this reality in, in terms of uh, how it gets represented to the public. Ever since the middle of the century, Americans have been getting accustomed to the notion that we are not alone in the universe. I, I think there's no question that the uh, tendency to show extraterrestrial encounters as either comical or sinister uh, does influence pe a certain number of people who don't know any better. It re it, there, there's a tendency to represent the contact with whatever you want to call this, uh, this other, this intelligence that's reaching us, to, to tends to represent it uh, as frightening, as dark, taking over, uh, we have to fight them, you know, sort of like movies like Independence Day, uh, which uh, show us uh, somehow conquering this terrible alien invasion. The public's views showed a dramatic change during the early 60s with a boom in popularity of sci-fi movies. The public felt a sense of security by relegating alien contact to the realm of entertainment, while in the real world, the government tried to explain away UFOs with reasons like swamp gas and weather balloons. New movies and broadcasting has proved that society's views have evolved. The public is more open to this than the uh, elite, you know, the, the general public. If I meet people in a bar or in the street or have seen something I've done on TV, they say, oh yeah, yeah, we understand that, that makes sense. Popular culture has portrayed extraterrestrials in a more intellectual light. Individuals in the military have come forward with contact information, but no official statement has been made to confirm or deny any such evidence. Whenever such evidence is brought forward by a private citizen, the response has generally been skepticism. As a result, the public remains doubtful about the credibility of these phenomena because of insufficient information. Perhaps the only logical conclusions that we can draw are the ones that come from our own self-examination. 
the kind of technology that we now have is a product essentially of the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. And that is why I spent so much time researching the story of the Luddites. Because the Luddites were people in England at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution who said, wait, what is this technology going to do to us, to us in particular, to our jobs, to our families, to our communities, to the environment? And they said they didn't like these new steam technologies coming in. They didn't like these new factories that were being produced because they did people out of jobs. And they said they, they, they took their torches and they took their rifles and they took their hammers and they smashed those factories. The government of England, in response to this, mounted the greatest armed force against its own citizens that it has ever done. And within about three or four years, managed to put down this Luddite rebellion. And so the Industrial Revolution was allowed to proceed. These people were done out of their jobs. Their communities were destroyed. The environment was black. And this is the kind of stuff that Dickens eventually wrote about. The awful price that had to be paid so that the Industrial Rev Revolution could succeed. And so I wrote about these Luddites and told the story of what they did then. And then I tried to bring it forward 150 years to talk about the people today who are resisting the trends of modern high technology. The fact is that the initial big bang of technological innovation and progress was soon followed by the marriage of the military elite to private companies who exploited this technology and have made billions of dollars from it. Silicon Valley produces 68 millionaires per week. It has opened up the economy to a whole new territory. NASA Ames Research and Silicon Valley are recognizing that alien technology is now public knowledge. Yet the government is still secretive about reverse engineering that is continuing today. For example, special agents from NASA's Office of the Inspector General are investigating private entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. On October 5, 1999, I did a story for the San Francisco Examiner about a meeting that was going to be held here in California uh, between people at the NASA Ames Research Center and high-tech Silicon Valley executives. We checked it out and it turned out that they were indeed going to have this meeting. Subsequent to that story, got a call from a NASA investigator that was really concerned because at that meeting, they were going to be talking about propulsion technologies and Joe Fermage was interested in those technologies because he firmly believes that there is reverse engineering of alien technologies that have helped Silicon Valley be what it is today. Thinking about the computer revolution and its effect on society, you would be blind not to realize how dangerous and pernicious and evil it has been. And I say that in the full recognition that there are individuals who have benefited from it and that there are certain connections that have been made and people love to have their email and they love to be able to uh, be online for this and that. But all of that is trivial. Trivial, whatever tiny personal enjoyments or benefits it has produced for individuals. The important thing about this technology is to see what it has done to the world. It's true that a few will be richer and richer, but what happens in a society, in a global society, where there are just a few rich and there are masses of poor? It is unsustainable. What I'm spelling out for you here is a scenario that inevitably leads to tragedy. And we can see it happening already, but I think it won't be more than 20 years or so before all of this collapses. Because we have these dominant government corporate forces eating up the world, pushing people aside, and attempting to create a world that is entirely artificially, entirely technology dominated. A technosphere that will eliminate the biosphere. Alien technology causes destruction of our environment at a rapid rate. Its power is beyond what we are able to control. The destructive effects reach out to all areas of the earth and the life that it sustains. 
How much time do we have before it is too late to reverse the damage from alien technology? People disconnected from nature abuse our ecosystem, which degrades our planet to near fatal levels. Our production of waste rivals our production of technologies that improve the human condition. Think of this. Over there on Wall Street is the beginning process by which four trillion dollars, trillion dollars, is being traded around the world every single day. Four trillion dollars. Now you don't trade that stuff buying and selling around the world without having an effect, a real life effect upon the jobs and the lives and the communities of people. But the psychological effects of all of this are to distance people from the real things that they need in their lives. Love, sodality, community, poetry, dreams, all of the important things. So what I see happening is uh, an accumulation of environmental crises melding with these economic and political crises so that the whole thing collapses. Now, it's possible that the human species will survive that. But it will do so only if it's in vastly reduced numbers, people living in small uh, nature regarding communitarian societies. That is to say, tribal societies, much the way humans have lived for 90% of the time they've been on Earth. They've lived in those kinds of nature-loving, nature-regarding, small-scale societies. I think it's possible that we might get back to that. On the other hand, if the pollution, uh, if the destruction is as great as it, as it might well be, uh, it will threaten the existence of the human species on the Earth. Is this the first global technological crisis of its kind? Are we living in a world where all of the technology that we depend on could stop functioning? Or does alien technology have a manifest destiny of its own to dominate the globe? Alien technology has fragmented our system of representation. It fragments communities and alienates people from each other as it takes control. The portability of information may ultimately erode privacy. Soon, people will carry their electronic identity within their skin. This information will be read and tracked by anyone who has the equipment to do so. The gap between those who control the technological machinery and those who are controlled by it may determine what life will be like for the next generation. Will there be more government control over the economy? Will there be more government control over our lives? A bold new world order. Or is it technology that is controlling our lives? In politically underdeveloped countries, alien technology has fatal consequences. The U.S. military will not come forward with information surrounding the development of alien technology. Research continues as defense technology reaches for more sophisticated and lethal weapons. The government's priority is to maintain military and economic supremacy and keep the secrets of alien technology that created its power. The American defense system has increased its contractual research with private companies. These companies research independently and operate under total secrecy under the authority of national security. In his 1961 farewell address to the nation, President Eisenhower warned us of the dangers caused by the very situation that our country finds itself in today. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. Akin to and largely responsible for the sweeping changes in our industrial military posture has been the technological revolution during recent decades. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive 
of a scientific, technological elite. The social, economic, political, and environmental consequences of the unbridled rapid growth of technology in all phases of our lives beget a fundamental question. Are we the master of or the slaves to high technology? Do we expect technology to be the solution to our problems? Perhaps we have lost the ability to reassert control over our lives. We may be so technologically dependent that any failure in the system could lead to a catastrophe like a nuclear meltdown. Can we forestall or prepare for such a catastrophe if we are unable or unwilling to address these issues now at a time of unprecedented prosperity? Every major city in the United States is a part of only three power grids that supply all of our energy. These systems were built on a computer language called COBOL, Common Business Oriented Language. This computing language was developed by the U.S. Navy in 1957 under the authority of Admiral Roscoe Hillenketter of Harry Truman's Majestic 12. Naval officer G.M. Hopper directed the group that wrote the COBOL language. Why was the U.S. Navy involved in creating a language for use in our land-based power grids? Was the Navy's programming knowledge the only way to reverse engineer alien processors? Socially, we are in danger of losing our sense of humanity, our sense of morality, even our sense of family and its critical role in our society. We need to assess the consequences our frenzied electronic way of life has on our planet. Breakthroughs in medical and drug research hold out the promise of treatment, cure, and prevention of our most dreaded diseases, even cancer and AIDS. Computer technology enhances our ability to diagnose, treat, and cure illness. Magnetic resonance imaging can provide doctors with detailed 3D images of affected organs and tissues. Advances in cardiac surgery techniques continue to enable physicians and practitioners to battle the number one killer in the United States, heart disease. Nearly a thousand satellites orbit the Earth daily and contribute to our increased knowledge of our planet and its atmosphere and weather. Scientists deploy increasingly sophisticated weather radar, forecast pinpoint dangerous weather patterns today more quickly and accurately than ever before. Good evening. Hurricane Andrew continues on its path towards the southeast Florida coast at this hour. The center of the hurricane is expected to cross the dade Broward area sometime between 6 and 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. Because of this advanced technology, communities have more time to take emergency measures in the face of a violent storm. The deployment of the Hubble telescope in the mid-1990s allows man to see to the very edge of the universe. Extraordinary images of deep space astonish and electrify us. The recent World Trade Organization protests in Seattle were led by labor, environmental, humanist neo-Luddites, and fringe groups focused on economic and environmental issues yet pollution and waste have already done substantial damage. Ironically, a comparatively low-tech alternative to fossil fuel and uranium is wind power. In some regions, it provides clean, reliable energy which could significantly reduce our reliance on imported oil, 
coal, or nuclear power. Unfortunately, the nuclear power industry is encouraged to develop through government subsidies several times the amount that solar or wind power development will ever receive. With the internet eclipsing one billion pages and counting, today's e-revolution is spurring an unprecedented global economic boom. E-commerce is expected to top several trillion dollars in the next few years. Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, pointed out the critical role of high technology in the growth and reshaping of our economy and society. There are few signs to date of slowing in the pace of innovation and the spread of our newer technologies that, as I have indicated in previous testimonies, have been at the root of our, our extraordinarily impressive productivity improvement. What is uncertain is the future pace of the application of these innovations, because it is this pace that governs the rate of change in productivity and economic potential. Since nearly any human being can link up individually to the rest of the world, the Internet may be the greatest mechanism of democracy ever made. Yet with such unlimited worldwide access to each other, how will our lives be affected? Just in the last few months, serious concerns over privacy and safety on the net have spurred government and corporate responses to arrest and prosecute hackers and other criminals. We may never find definite answers to the mysteries of alien technologies, but because of mankind's discovery and development of extraterrestrial tools, humanity has raced generations beyond our time closer to our own enlightenment or destruction as a species. Furthermore, the rapid pace of technological change has only magnified these problems. So where does it all end? The disparity between the rich and poor nations and individuals continues to grow. The destruction of the rainforests and other habitat, nuclear proliferation, biological weapons, global warming, and ozone depletion show the immediate and direct consequences of technology gone amok. America is the largest arms merchant in the world. This undermines our credibility as a nation of peace. Recent wars in Iraq and Yugoslavia also show the trend toward high-tech electronic warfare where drones, cruise missiles, and global positioning satellites enable the Pentagon to wage truly impersonal surgical war. Since the Big Bang of technology in the mid-20th century, we have seen the application and misapplication of this reverse-engineered alien technology in every aspect of our lives. We must raise our consciousness on a personal, emotional, global, and even spiritual level. We need to demystify and emasculate the iconography of technology. Maybe we can think and act less selfishly, with a greater sense of community, both locally and globally. Collectively, we can insist that our government, major corporations, academia, and the military seriously consider the consequences of our technological revolution. As citizens, we must insist our leaders address these issues both here and abroad. Globally, the U.S. as the world's sole superpower must take the lead in shaping and applying high technology. America and its allies must press for a more thoughtful, slower approach to technological change. The Internet is the latest and perhaps an especially sinister example of high technology being used to foster racism, bigotry, and hatred. Our power is not through one person or group or nation. Collectively, we as human beings must fight against complacency, indifference, and ignorance. The world is shrinking every day, and we must act now to save our own humanity. The infinite power of the human mind and spirit can help us harness technology while protecting and healing ourselves and Mother Earth. Otherwise, we may eventually be doomed to nuclear, biological, or technological oblivion.
extraordinarily advanced technology for propulsion, communication, surveillance, and scientific inquiry. This technology was previously only theorized by scientists. This shocking discovery prompted President Harry S. Truman to organize the Majestic 12, an elite group of high-level government officials, military officers, scientists, and academicians. They devised a plan to dissect and assess the potential application of these technologies for military and commercial use. This process came to be known as reverse engineering. With the advent of the Cold War, the Majestic 12 and its program was conducted under the highest level of secrecy since the Manhattan Project. Their goal was to disseminate these technologies to the private sector at firms which were already developing technologies garnered from the war effort. In August of 1947, an alien-created microcircuitry artifact was delivered to Bell Labs. Bell Labs was ready for the challenge of reverse engineering. Within five months, by December of that same year, Bell Labs would introduce to the public the first electronic transistor. Bell Labs physicists Walter Bertain, John Bardeen, and William Shockley were the first to successfully reverse Alien technology. In the mid-20th century, U.S. Army research and development at the Pentagon brought the world into a new age. Incredible advances were made, which helped to bring Americans to the highest standard of living ever achieved by a nation. Were outside sources and government influences involved in the origins of high technology? Does the new quantum leap in technological sophistication suggest the role of some outside influence? Could technology, like the microchip, which is ubiquitous in our lives, have come from an extraterrestrial source? Is it alien technology? If the acquisition of alien technology is a fact, that certainly could have happened. Uh, my guess is, uh, that if we did pick up any technology at all, it would have then landed in a very sensitive, compartmentalized uh, intelligence area in which only a very limited number of people would have access to that information. In the late 40s, the US military recovered a spacecraft of unknown origin that utilized extraordinary technology to the private sector. All this was known, only it wasn't known in the form where we gave them our practices. We gave them research and development projects.
one of the things that strikes you most about Philip Corso is not just the fact that he sounds credible, but when you go into his background and you look at the places he's been and where he served and what assignments he's had through the different wars from World War II through Korea, then back to the Pentagon, when you look at that, what you see is that the guy just rings credible. He is like rivet plate metal. Trudeau brought him in. He sat at the foreign technology desk as the deputy at that desk for 90 days, and then he went black. He went secret and became Trudeau's deputy and carry out Trudeau's own assignment, which was get this material from the spacecraft into American industry, the only place it could be safe. Are these alien technologies? What kinds of applications did we reverse engineer from outside technologies? Here, Corso said in 1961, he was looking at what turned out to be a fully functional electronic... Reverse engineer microcircuitry. This first example of reverse engineered technology showed crudeness in the area of micro manipulation of particles. The revolutionary ability to control electrons would permanently replace the crude vacuum tube bulb. First of all, Shockley and his team had been working on transistor technology. Of course, nobody called it a transistor back then, but they were working on this technology, basically an electronic gate to send electrons through that was more efficient than the vacuum tube. Now, the workbench notes that they had back then, the notes themselves were reverse engineered. They didn't publish those workbench notes until after 1949. Soon, all life on Earth would be affected by this application of outside information. On the day that was declared the day of discovery, life on this planet changed. Later, General Arthur Trudeau took over the responsibility of distributing technological artifacts from U.S. Army R&D offices at the Pentagon. Colonel Philip J. Corso, intelligence officer for Army Research and Development at the Pentagon, was the first to step forward with information about alien technology. In 1997, when Lieutenant Colonel Corso published his national best-selling book, neither the federal government nor any corporation or individual sought to discredit or refute his revelations about the Pentagon distributing aliens.